from Judges chapter 2, 1 to 4, 6 to 8, 10 to 12. God's messenger spoke to the people of Israel, saying, I rescued you out of the land of Egypt and brought you into this land that I have promised to your ancestors. I told you I will never break my covenant with you as your part of this bargain. You shall not make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You must tear down the altar of their gods. But you did not do as I commanded. Do you realize what you have done? Now I tell you, I will not drive them out before you. The people of the land will irritate you and their gods will ensnare you. When the Eternal's messenger spoke these words to Israel, the people wept bitterly. When Joshua sent the people away, each tribe of Israel went to gain possession of its territorial inheritance. The people served the Eternal as long as Joshua lived and through all the days of the elders who lived outlived Joshua, those who had seen all the great works that the Eternal had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the eternal servant, died at the age of 110 years. Now that whole generation, the generation that had walked with Moses, the generation that saw the walls of Jericho fall, that generation passed on, and another generation grew up after them, a generation that did not know the eternal and had not seen the great works he had done for Israel. Consequently, this new generation served the gods of Canaan, the Baals, as they were called, doing what the eternal God considered evil. They abandoned the eternal one, the true God of their ancestors, who brought them safely out of Egypt. Instead, they began to serve the gods of their neighbors, the Canaanites, bowing low before their images, causing the eternal to burn with anger. And continuing on in chapter 13, once again, though, the Israelites did evil according to the eternal God, and he gave the Philistines power over them for 40 years. During that time, a man in Zorah named Manoah, from the tribe of Dan, was married to a wife who could bear him no children. The messenger of the Lord appeared and said, You are barren and have no children, but all of that is about to change. You will conceive and have a son. Be careful that you don't drink wine or any other strong drinks, and don't eat anything that is ritually impure, for you're going to become pregnant and have a son. Don't ever use a razor on his head, because you will raise this boy as a Nazarite, dedicated to the true God from his conception, and he will be the one to begin delivering Israel from the Philistines. In due time, the woman did bear a son, and she named him Samson. The boy grew, the eternal God blessed him, and the spirit of the eternal one began to move in him in Mahane Den, between Zorah and this is the word of the Lord. Amen. First Corinthians chapter one, verse thirty-one says, "Let him who boasts boast in the Lord." Let him who boasts boast in the Lord. This is a standard question on undergrad applications. In order for the admissions staff of our college to get to know you, the applicant, better, we ask that you answer the following question. Are there any significant experiences you have had or accomplishments you have realized that have helped to define you as a person? Pretty standard question. One applicant named Hugh Gallagher sent this response to NYU, New York University. I am a dynamic figure often seen scaling walls and crushing ice. I've been known to remodel train stations on my lunch breaks, making them more efficient in the area of heat retention. I translate ethnic slurs for Cuban refugees. I write award-winning operas. I manage time efficiently. Occasionally, I tread water for three days in a row. I woo women with my sensuous and godlike trombone play. <laughs> I can pilot bicycles up severe inclines with unflagging speed, and I cook 30-minute brownies in 20 minutes. I am an expert in stucco, a veteran in love, and an outlaw in Peru. Using only a hoe and a large glass of water, I once single-handedly defended a small village in the Amazon basin from a horde of ferocious army ants. 
I play bluegrass cello. I was scouted by the Mets. I am the subject of numerous documentaries. When I'm bored, I build large suspension bridges in my yard. I enjoy urban hang gliding. On Wednesdays after school, I repair electrical appliances free of charge. I'm an abstract artist, a concrete analyst, and a ruthless bookie. Critics worldwide swoon over my original line, corduroy evening wear. I don't perspire. I am a private citizen, yet I receive fan mail. I have been caller number nine and have won the weekend passes. Last summer, I toured New Jersey with a traveling centripetal force demonstration. I bat 400. My deft floral arrangements, my deft floral arrangements, have earned me fame in international botany circles. Children, trust me. I can hurl tennis rackets at small moving objects with deadly accuracy. I once read Paradise Lost, Moby Dick, and David Copperfield in one day and still had time to refurbish an entire dining room that evening. I know the exact location of every food item in the supermarket. I have performed several covert operations with the CIA. I sleep once a week. When I do sleep, I sleep in a chair. While on vacation in Canada, I successfully negotiated with a group of terrorists who had seized a small bakery. The laws of physics do not apply to me. I balance, I weave, I dodge, I frolic, and my bills are all paid. On weekends, to let off steam, I participate in full contact origami. <laughs> Years ago, I discovered the meaning of life, but I forgot to write it down. I have made extraordinary four-course meals using only a muli and a toaster oven. I breed prize-winning prize clams. I have won bullfights in San Juan, cliff diving competitions in Sri Lanka, and spelling bees at the Kremlin. I have played Hamlet, I have performed open heart surgery, and I have spoken with Elvis, but I have not yet gone to college. Oh. <laughs> Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. <clears throat> Today we're going to be in the book of Judges. Everybody say Judges. Judges. Now Judges is one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. Now here's why. Some of you who read last week's chapter of the story, chapter 8, go, oh my goodness, how violent, how brutal, how gory, how... Yes. Awesome. <laughs> as, a, as somebody who enjoys action movies, that's right up my alley. So if, if you think that the Bible is boring, <clears throat> read Judges. If you think that it's all just a bunch of people lecturing on and on and on about all sorts of kind of floaty, ethereal ideas like love and grace and hope, read Judges. If you believe that God is all butterflies and teddy bears and that he's not interested in justice, read Judges. Or if you just want to freak people out when they say that's not in the Bible, read Judges. There's all sorts of stuff. All sorts of stuff. And, and honestly, being the storyteller that I love to be, I wish I could just sit down here on my stool and spend the next six to eight hours talking to you about all these different stories because I love them. I love the details and the way that God works in certain things. But, alas, we can't spend six to eight hours. And I haven't gotten much sleep in the last couple days, so I probably wouldn't be able to sit that still for very long anymore. Judges. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to the book of Judges. And we're going to start off in Judges chapter 2, starting with verse 10. Judges chapter 2, Judges chapter 2, verse 10. Today's sermon, today's message, uh, our discussion is, well, it's kind of a monologue, is titled, A Few Good Men and Women. Now, I understand completely uh, that uh, in the book of Judges, there are some judges uh, who are men, and there are some judges who are women, and, and honestly, we need them both. Uh, in order for this whole thing to work, in order for the, the people of God to be delivered at certain points in history, they needed both. Judges like Delilah, judges like uh, 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 Jael, and judges, there's one more, and I can't remember it for some reason. Uh, but we need the women, okay? So please hear me on this. I would include them, but I only have 20 minutes now, roughly. 
You guys know how rough it is. Roughly 20 minutes. <laughs> and in order to frame out the whole book of Judges, I'm going to focus on two. They're both guys. So, ladies, is it okay that I only focus on the guys today? You're not going to come after me. Okay. All right. Judges chapter 2. Now, when you think of Judges, uh, in, in today's culture, we think of, well, I think of the cartoony, you know, powder white wigs, the long black robes, the hammer and the, and the gavel, right? And that's what we think of as a judge. Or maybe in more contemporary setting, you think of Judge Judy, right? Uh, I love Judge Judy. She's so honest and to the point, just like the book of Judges. Uh, but these are not the same types of judges, okay? The judges in the book of Judges, the judges in the book of Judges are warriors, leaders, uh, somebody who's going to march the people into battle because the people of God have been basically not people of God. They've been doing their own thing, chasing after their own desires. Uh, they've been wandering, as we know. And now that they've been brought into the promised land by Joshua, everybody say Joshua. Joshua. Right, we learned about Joshua last week. Joshua brought this whole second generation into the promised land, but they still have the same issues, right? They still follow their desires. And so in uh, Judges chapter 2, starting with verse 10, it says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, that means Joshua and everybody that's as old as Joshua, <laughs> everybody in his generation, that whole second generation of Israelites, after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, they died, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals. Does anybody else consider that extremely tragic? That you have two generations prior to this, right? You have Moses and his generation. Let my people go! And they cross the Red Sea, and the, the plagues, and the pillar of fire, and the... And they're too busy making golden cows to realize what God is doing, and so they don't need to go. The next generation is like, okay, we know mom and dad, they messed up, but we are dedicated, we are ready, let's go. And they charge into the promised land, and they clear a place out, right, because they're protecting what matters. And yet, somewhere along the line, the message doesn't get passed down. Are we repeating history? Seven times that phrase, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Seven times. Everybody say seven times. Seven times. Seven times that phrase, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There's this vicious cycle in the book of Judges. If you've ever, how many people have ever read through the book of Judges? Awesome. Awesome. A couple people. Okay. So, I'll just lay it out for you, okay? Here's how it works. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They did their own thing. God says, it's not going to fly. And they face the consequences. They have other groups, other nations that come, they invade, they enslave, they, they kill some, they, they do all this stuff, they oppress God's people. Who then go, God, help us. Sometimes we do that, wait till we're in trouble to ask for any help. And uh, God raises up a judge or judges, leaders, who can lead people into victory. <clears throat> Israelites did evil, face the consequences, cry for help, deliverance. Over and over and over and over and over again. If you flip through the book of Judges, there are a ton of judges, and some rule for 40 years, some rule for 20, some rule for 80. And there's peace during that time, but after they die, after the people go, well, that was nice, now let's slide back into this comfort zone, into this evil little area that we like, then we start the cycle over again. And so, we come to a man named Gideon. Everybody say Gideon. 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 Now, if you've ever been to a hotel... <laughs> Thank you. 
Now you know who they're talking about. Judges chapter 6. I don't hear pages turning at all. <laughs> Judges chapter 6, starting with verse 12. Now we'll start with verse 11, just because. The angel of the Lord, Judges 6, verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, the long Joash the Abizurite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Verse 13. But sir, Gideon replies, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all these wonders that our fathers told us when, about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us, put us into the hand of Midian. So Gideon, everybody say Gideon. Gideon. Gideon is one of the two characters we're going to focus on today. Gideon is a judge, but he doesn't know it yet. He's a mighty leader, a warrior, but he doesn't know it yet. In fact, he, he says, I'm from the weakest clan, the weakest tribe, I'm the runt of the litter. You look a few more verses down past where we read. He says, no, 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 I, I can't, it's not me. An angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord appears. I mean, you think the harp music would give it away. The angel of the Lord appears, and he says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And the first thing that Gideon says is, but. Everybody say, but. But. <laughs> the first word out of his mouth is contradiction. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Come on, all right, let's charge him. No, there's no gum to hoe. There's no uh, uh, oh, umption in his gumption, or how that song goes. There, there's no excitement, no fire. It's, but, but I'm not. I'm the. Not me. Uh. He saw himself as the weakest. Verse 15. I mentioned it earlier, verse 15. The, the angel of the Lord says, Am I not sending you? Right? I'll go in strength. I'll say in Israel, Am I not sending you? Verse 15. But Lord, which is that same word for sir, sir and Lord, same word in the original language, get me asked, How can I save Israel? My plan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. I'm the weakest. I'm the least. He says, I'm a, I'm a blank canvas. I got nothing. I'm boring. No color. No excitement. No distinguishing features. I can't do it. Blank canvases can be good. Uh, has anybody ever painted before? Anybody ever painted? Painters? Yeah, we got some. How many people like to paint? How many people despise painting? <laughs> Uh, real quick story, I was at my previous church and uh, they were redoing their eating area and we had gotten some booths from a renovated dairy room. And it was my job, my chore, to paint these things so that they looked new and presentable. Except, when you paint light colors over dark colors, dark colors come through all the time. And so you got to like pile it on. If they were completely clear, completely blank, if, if they came with no distinguishing features, then they're a lot easier to paint on. <coughs> right? And while Gideon is a blank canvas, his focus is still on him. <coughs> Do you know people, maybe you are people, don't point. <laughs> Do you know people who are after pity? All the time? My life is terrible. This is always happening. I am not the smartest. I am not the fastest. I have this wrong. I have that wrong. Blah, 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 blah. It's a false humility. Right? The goal is still for you to look at me. Gideon had to learn the difference. And he, he doesn't believe God. God calls him a mighty warrior. He doesn't believe him. And so here's what he does. He says, God, I'll take what? You want me to do this, right? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. 
well, here's the deal. I, I need to be sure. So I'm going to lay this fleece jacket I got from North Face. I'm going to lay this down. <laughs> Too fast. I'm going to lay this down <laughs> on the ground. And God, here's what I want you to do. And when I wake up in the morning, I want the fleece. Wakes up the next morning, fleece is wet, ground is dry. Whoa. All right, that was impressive, God. Now let me try it one more time, just to be sure. <clears throat> just to be sure. And God says, didn't you hear the heart music? Mm -hmm. Angel of the Lord, the mm -hmm. Lord. Yeah, but just to be sure that you really want me to do this, God, I'm going to try it one more time. I'm going to lay the fleece down. Flip it over. It's reversible. I'm going to lay it down <laughs> on the ground. And I want the ground to be wet and the fleece to be dry. Water resistant. Okay, so wakes up the next morning, fleece is dry, ground is wet. He says, all right, I'm ready to go. Whatever you say, God, we're going to go defeat the Midianites. Everybody say, Gideon. Gideon. Mighty warrior. Mighty warrior. Yeah. And so he charges, and he gathers all his troops. He says, guys, look at my jacket. Right? God did this awesome thing. So we're going to go into battle. We're going to take these guys, and, and we're going to take back our land. God is going to deliver us. And so he gathers together 32,000 soldiers. Everybody say 32,000. 32,000. 32 Mazan. 32,000 people he gathers together who are going to face the Midianites, which number somewhere in the area of about 200,000 conservatively. Now, that would have been impressive. Right? 32,000. Yeah, we're going to go face this huge army and we're going to defeat them. That, that would have been impressive. And Gideon, he comes before God and says, God, all right, look, i got 32,000 guys ready to go. And God says, what? Don't need all those. Send some home. <laughs> Do I need to do the jacket thing? Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so he sends 22,000 guys home. 22,000 guys get their marching orders. Go home. Take a leave, right? We don't need you. Just me and, me and 10,000 guys against 200,000 at least. Okay, all right. He says, God, look. I sent a bunch home like you asked. Uh, so now it's me and only 10,000 guys. It's going to be this great. And God says, whoa, 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 whoa. 10,000? Do you know who you're working with here? Come on. Less of you, more of me. Send some home. So to cut the story short, er, uh, it gets to be 300 guys. 300, say 300. 300. To 200,000. The odds of that is about 666 to 1. It's a busy day of fighting. But God wanted to make it perfectly and completely and utterly clear that it was not Gideon. And it was not these 300 guys. It was a God sized problem with only a God sized solution. And they were victorious. I wish I could tell you the story, but you're going to have to go to Judges and read it yourself. He's hot. On we are. <laughs> Martin Luther, the great German evangelist, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther said, unless a man is nothing, God can make nothing out of him. Unless a man is nothing, God can make nothing out of him. It wasn't until Gideon, even in his little bit of pride, said, Okay, God, and 300 guys, if that's what you want. It wasn't until he got to that point that God made him victorious. Until a man is nothing, God can make nothing out of him. Everybody still awake? Yeah, we haven't even got to the glory stuff yet, so we're good. We're good. Let him boast, boast in the Lord. It's an honest humility. Honest humility. I told you that that phrase, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That appeared how many times? Seven. 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 Good job. Everybody else who didn't say seven, wake up. Uh, seven times. There's another phrase that occurs seven times, and that is the Spirit of the Lord. Everybody say, Spirit of the Lord. Spirit, Spirit of the Lord. Lord. Wait, 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 wait. 
Are you telling me that the Holy Spirit was actually doing something even before Acts? Even before the church got started? Even before Jesus was born, the Holy Spirit was involved? Hmm? Yeah. The Spirit of the Lord, that phrase occurs seven times. Now, one time it occurs with, Josh, uh, with, with um, Gideon. Uh, Another time it occurs elsewhere, and another time it occurs elsewhere, but four, four of the seven times that that phrase, the Spirit of the Lord, is mentioned is with a man named Samson. Everybody say Samson. Samson. How many people have ever heard of Samson? Amazing. Amazing. And yet nobody, hardly anybody rose their hand to say that they read the book of Judges, which means that Samson's story is very well known. It's exciting. And it starts in Judges chapter 13. Judges 13, if you have but Judges 13, we are flying <laughs> through the book again. I wish, I wish we could sit down more time. Come to Bible study this week. We'll talk more about some of the judges. Six o'clock Wednesday night. Bring a friend. Judges chapter 13. <laughs> Judges chapter 13, starting with verse 25. I read part of this earlier, right? Uh, a woman, barren, childless, sounds familiar, right? Angel of the Lord says, you will have a son. He's going to be set aside. He's going to be different. And, and they're told to take these Nazarite vows, which you don't need to know a whole lot about, except it's just dedication. It's being holy, set apart, unique. Don't drink wine when you're pregnant. Okay? Don't touch dead things. They were considered ritually impure. Okay, again. And then this one's interesting. No razor will touch his head. Don't shave him. Don't cut his hair. That's the part we all remember. Because that's the one that Samson kept the longest. Judges chapter 13. Verse 24 says, The woman gave birth to a boy named him Samson. Everybody say Samson. Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord <coughs> began to stir him. Now, I looked up that word stir, because it's interesting. That word stir has the idea of an anvil. You think a blacksmith working on a piece of metal, a sword, or, or an arrowhead, or something, hammering it out, disturbing it, beating it, pushing it. Stir. It also has the idea of a bell. When a, a bell is struck and noise is made. You get the picture? It's this beating, this striking. It's God is making something here. And the person who's recalling these stories in the book of Judges says, God was up to something. <clears throat> Samson grows up. And he's strong. And not even just strong, like freaky strong. Uh, when he was a young man, early marriage, his first marriage, he comes back home, and there a lion jumps out, a full-grown lion. And he says that Samson tore the lion apart with his bare hands. Anybody tear up any lions lately? <laughs> yeah. So Samson is a strong, powerful guy. And the problem is, he knew it. And so Samson would brag about it, right? Samson was victorious. God used Samson. He endowed him with this strength, this gift, this ability, this blessing. And Samson used it, but then he bragged about it, right? He was victorious in battle a lot. Which gets you a lot of praise, a lot of accolades, a lot of women. A lot of people liked Samson, invited him to all their parties so he could tell stories. He, he told one story. He says, there was this one time, uh, the people here were scared, they were afraid, so they handed me over to the Philistines. They tied me up. They thought that was going to do the trick. I said, all right, fellas, step back. Once I got into enemy camp, I popped the cords. I grabbed the jaw of a donkey. A dead one. The jawbone of a donkey and killed 10,000 of the enemy. And then 
I love this part. I love judges. It's funny. Uh, and then Samson brags, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain them and made donkeys of them. <laughs> ah. Now, in the original language, that that word donkey sounds a lot like heap. Okay, so it could be piled up, but our American culture is a whole lot funnier. So, <laughs> Samson has all this stuff happening, all this attention, all this popularity. He goes to these parties and he's drinking and having a good time. Remember. He wasn't supposed to do that. And he, he comes across a, 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 a donkey's jawbone, a dead one. He picks it up. Remember, he wasn't supposed to do that. And he begins playing with these people. He, he, his first wife, she gets killed. So he, he starts going out with this other lady. And uh, she keeps... Trying, she's more interested in money than she is in Samson. And so she is trying to find out the secret to his strength. What makes you so strong, Samson? And Samson plays with her. Because he had been he had done this before. He says, Well, if you tie me up with fresh rope, I will be a weak man. Ties him up. Samson, Samson. He wakes up, busts through the rope, and kills these guys who were trying to capture him. And he, he must enjoy this, right? Because anybody else, if you read through the book of Judges, anybody else would be an idiot to fall for this game like three or four times like Samson does. So he must just enjoy it, toying with people. And it, it goes on again. Samson, how, do you, how are you so strong? What can we do? What would make you weaker? Well, if you tie my hair into a weave and uh, get stuck in a sewing machine, then that would do it. Uh, no, if you need fresh cords, uh, yeah, that, that would do it. And again and again and again, Samson busts out, he breaks out, he frees himself, and he kills. That's what he does. Gains more and more popularity. And he gets to the end, and what's the secret? And Samson, who has <coughs> three things that he was supposed to do in life. Three things. Don't drink anything that grows from a grapevine. Don't touch anything dead. Don't cut your hair. God will be with you. God will protect you. God will lead you into victory. Three things that he has to do, and he blew the first two. And because he's getting so wrapped up in this game, because he likes the attention, he likes overcoming the odds, he likes himself. He said, well, if you cut my hair, then I'll be weak. He knew in the back of his mind, he's running through all those battles, all those memories where he thought he was the one being victorious. So Samson, Samson, he wakes up and says he thinks he's just going to bust free, but he realizes he's weak. What happened? And here's the thing. It says the Lord had left him. God blesses us, but when it becomes all about us, God says, well, fine. You want to do it? Go right ahead. <clears throat> Show us how it's done. Samson is captured for the first time in his life. He's beaten for the first time in his life. Has his eyes gouged out. There's a little war for you. And then he's brought to a party to celebrate foreign gods. And they say, hey, bring out Samson. Yeah, well, he'll entertain us. Oh, Samson, he's scary. Not so scary now. And in the final moments of his life, Samson is leaning against a pillar, and he says, God, I know, I know this was bad. And I know I deserve to die. But I ask you to give me strength one more time. It says that Samson's hair had already begun to grow back. God, give me strength one more time so that I can get vengeance on my enemies. It says he pushed down the pillars and slayed more Philistines in that one building, this huge entertainment complex, slayed more Philistines in that one building than he did his entire life. 
See, when it became less about Samson and more about God, then he was more victorious than he ever could have been on his own. Honest. Humility. A man by the name of Henry Nowen. Henry Nowen wrote a book called In the Name of Jesus. Henry Nowen uh, was an esteemed professor at Harvard and traded all that in to go work with the mentally and physically disabled up in Canada. Henry Nowen knows a little something about humility. And he said in his book, In the Name of Jesus, he said, it's a lot easier to be God than it is to love Him. <coughs> it's a lot easier to be God than it is to love Him. And so the question, the centering question, the focusing idea, the big thought of our talk together is, am I trying to be God? Are you trying to be God? Are we trying to be God? Are we trying to control things, trying to domineer and dominate and, and, and overlook everything? Here's a question. Maybe you want to write this down in your Bible or on your bulletin or on your hand. Who have I overlooked? Who have I forgotten about? Who have I looked down on? Who have I condemned? Who have I rejected? Who have I abandoned? And maybe beside that, right, who am I? See, I have an arrogance problem. Every single time that I step up here, every single time that I do my thing, this calling that I have from God, I have the overwhelming urge to dazzle. And every single Sunday, for me personally, I have to check myself at the door and check myself in prayer back there and say, God, help me to make this about you. See, Gideon and Samson are two, two sides of the same coin. Gideon's overwhelming, but, 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 well, no, look, I'm the runt, I'm the weakest, I'm the lowest. So about me. Samson, oh, I am awesome. I am strong. I am victorious. I am Samson. All about me. God calls us to be nothing so that he can make something out of us. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God our Father. One more story than I'm done. When he was a young man, Samson killed a lion. You remember this? Everybody remembers it? I told you like five minutes ago. <laughs> okay, 30. Uh, he killed this lion. And later on, he came across it. It was dead. It was 
still. But bees had moved in and made the innards of a lion into their own private hive. And they were making honey inside of it. Gideon, his other name that he was given was Jerob Baal, which means let Baal plead. Let him beg. God somehow is able to work with nothing.